Okay, right, thanks uh, for all being here, I think. Pretty much everybody's here. So today we're going to move on from where we were last week, which was looking at getting some basic data about those three serious fa service failures. And we're going to actually go into looking at some of the interesting questions we can ask about those service failures so that we can actually begin to understand what happened and hopefully find ways of avoiding them, those problems, in the future. Because we saw, and I'm sure you found from some of your work you've been doing since last week, that there were some interesting similarities between Denver Airport and uh, Terminal 5 at Heathrow. Not completely identical, but there were some critical causes. I want you to draw those out um, in the work we're going to do today, both in the sort of seminar section and then into the workshop section a bit later on. Just how, before we got started, while I was still up in the office, Clive came in and said, hey, what a great crowd you are, first of all, which is, I thought was rather nice. Um, he likes what you're doing, the way you guys are thinking, so do I. Um, and he was saying he'd actually introduced you to Porter's Five Forces. Yeah. As a way of kind of getting some of that business awareness that you really need to do. And that reminded me that when we at Rolls-Royce, or when I was at Rolls-Royce in sort of 98, 99, to early 2000, and we were doing a full business process re-engineering prior to implementing SAP, we actually used Porter's Five Forces in anger. They were the model that we used to analyze the work that we were actually doing in the company to as a, at the commercial, on the commercial side, commercial business side, and then so we could identify the big questions at the top of it and then and that kind of set out the five or six big modules that we were going to implement and then we broke it down to the next level and the next level and the next level until we we're right at the individual tasks that people were doing within their department as part of the workflow and that kind of links back to what I was saying last week about using Zachman's Enterprise Architecture Framework, that I am teaching you the top two levels of Zachman's Framework, uh, Dennis is teaching you of levels two and three, and Dave Voorhis and the databases team are teaching you the levels down to the bits and bytes, and the technology and the hardware. And the team project module, which you're also doing with Clive, is kind of stitched the whole lot together in a different direction from the way that I'm stitching them together. And all of us need to take account of this. And these are the six critical questions, um, that, the only questions you actually need to ask yourself in almost any circumstance to find out what's really happening. And they were kind of codified back in at the end of the um, 19th century or thereabouts, uh, early 20th century, when Rudyard Kipling was writing his stories. And he brought, said, I have six wise friends who taught me all that I know. And their names are what and why, who and how, where and when. And when we look at the Zachman architecture, you will see that those six questions are actually the titles of the six columns. The things that we need to understand about any situation or the answers we need to get from those six questions will tell us everything we need to know. Whether it's about Alaska, Denver, International, or Heathrow Terminal 5 in today's activities. And then as you move yourself into the assignment and choose your, the sort of service you're wanting to analyze, again, you will use that framework of those six questions to help you find the way into the problem, to find out what happened, why it happened, how it happened, where it happened, and when it happened. Because there is a time sequence in all three of those failed projects, which are really quite important. So, really, really important, those six questions. So, to expand a little bit, what? Okay, so 
Over to you, what do you think the question what can be applied to? In, in what sort of what questions might you want to ask? What happened? What happened? What could have been done to avoid this? What could have been done to avoid it? What was the aftermath? What was the aftermath? The consequences? So yeah, you can add lots of words after the what to drill down into what was happening. Question why? What are the interesting words you can add after the why? Why did it happen? Why did it happen? Why wasn't things done to prevent it? Why didn't people do things to prevent it? Why did the bosses encourage a, sh a low resource project when all the advice had been it's going to cost you two or three times as much as you wanted to spend? Why is going to be really specific to each case? Why will be very, very specific and you know, come out of what may come some, a whole lot of whys. And I mean, if you look forward a couple of years to when you, or three years when you're doing your dissertation project, you, know, you start off with one set of questions and they lead on and on and on into more and more questions. And that's why I keep saying I teach you questions, not answers. Like Clive was saying, the point about a theory is it helps you to uh, understand the questions you need to ask. I mean, how many of you know Newton's gravity of theory, the simple little formula? that it's the attraction of two masses divided by the force of gravity or what the constant of gravity and uh, something to do with the distance between them. Now, most physicists, most applied mathematicians will teach you that as the answer. Plug the numbers in and out pops an answer. But there's a totally different way of saying, okay, here's the maths that was proven in vacuum. What are the right questions we ought to ask about that mathematical formula to be useful in the real world? Because I can give you a couple of examples where, although the law of gravity, the mathematical formula, is being applied, there are other factors happening as well. For example, you can go up in an aeroplane, take a little mouse, and at 25,000 feet or any other height in between, you can throw it out of the door and it will float down. When it touches ground, it will walk away. <coughs> or one that's a bit more, a bit closer to home that my father, um, as a, a doctor, a surgeon, used to say was uh, the important question. A mother phones up accident emergency, very, very worried because her three, three month old child has somehow got out of the, fallen over the edge of the balcony and it bounced off the, the um, lawn below. The first question that a a good A&E doctor will say will be, is the child crying? And if the answer is yes, it's crying, then you know that it didn't matter. It's okay. It might be a bit bruised, but it's not broken anything by and large. If it's quiet, then you worry that it's got concussion or something like that. Whereas if one of us, being rather larger, had dropped out of the window, now because our bones are much stiffer and so on, where the baby's bones are almost like rubber, now, anything more than about six feet, we can hurt ourselves badly. I was talking to some, one of the third year students who does bouldering and dropped off the wall only that height, three foot six. Seriously damaged her ankle, broke three out of the four tendons, etc., etc. All sorts of interesting things that. Or if I drop a, a lead ball from here, it would probably fall through the, fall th the sec uh, secondary flooring here. Whereas if I drop a feather, it just sort of fluffles down. So it leads you to questions why, what else is happening other than that M1 times M2 over <coughs> or whatever. That leads you to what's happening and why is it happening and so on. So then you get to the who question. What sort of who words might you put after the who? in looking at LASCAD, at um, Heathrow Terminal 5, and Denver International. Where are the who questions going to lead you? Who was responsible? Who was responsible? Yeah. Who solved the problem? Who could solve the problem? Who did solve the problem? Yeah. 
if it's solved. Who was the leading engineer? Pardon? Who was the leading engineer? Who was the leading engineer? Now that comes up really importantly. You know, think about what's going on this last week or so with um, VW and the diesel engine fiddle in the electronic controls. And we're now hearing, as one expects, that the senior people are saying, well, it wasn't us, it wasn't corporate policy, it was a rogue engineer down there. Or if you go to um, the Macondo oil disaster, oh, we've got corporate policies that are green and are, you know, proper governance and so on. So it wasn't us at the top who were setting policies or directing them to save 50 million on the, with a quick fix, we had all these policies in place. It was a rogue engineer who decided to do something. I'll come back to that one as we go through some of this as well, as to what actually happened. And in both VW and in BP, there's something going on where them at the top are fundamentally responsible. responsible. So some more who's, thinking of the LASCAD, Denver City, uh, International Airport and uh, Heathrow, uh, Terminal 5 Heathrow. You've got it up there, like, who was affected by the uh, ambulance situation? Who was affected? Well, who were? Well, you know, I meant like the, uh, <coughs> the like, well, you could say this, who, uh, the state probably maybe, but I'm talking about the people who got like, affected from ambulance not being able to... So you've got the it. driver of the ambulance doesn't know what's yeah. going on. You've got who else is af being affected? The person needs the ambulance. The yeah. person needing the ambulance I, I and the person in the control room a lot as things. a minimum three. How? What comes after how here? What sort of words you, and aspects are you going to be looking at? How did the system fail? How did the system fail? How can we improve on it in the future? How can we improve it on, on it in the future? But how did we let it happen? How did they let it happen? How, how did they let, let it happen? happen? Yeah. How were the requirements captured in the first instance? If you think about at least two out of the three, if you look at Las Cat and Denver City, Denver International. Yeah, there's all, all sorts of interesting howls about the whole project process, about how the formulae were sorted, or the algorithms were being designed or not designed in Denver. Um, how was it solved? Did someone say that one? Yes, how was it solved, if it was? <coughs> How um, were, were the problems circumvented? You know, in the time it takes to re fix the software, it, all three of those, what happened or what did they do? How did they do it to keep the system running? The on costs of coping with a failed IT system, which was at the basis of that six, bit, six trillion dollar problem that I mentioned last year, week. <coughs> and it's, I mean, okay, so it's maybe a fairly uh, excessive, in some people's eyes, calculation, but there's still a lot of interesting stuff about that. Where? Where did the problem occur? In what sort of sense of where? Are you thinking of geography or what? I suppose both geographically and, like, in the scale of the project. In the scale of the project, yeah. Inside the software, even. Where was the error? And if, if you're looking at VW, where is the software inside the ECU? A nice little bit that cleverly detects particular characteristics of the driving uh, that was being undertaken. They said, ooh, I think I'm in a test mode. I will switch to test mapping. Where were the people that were supposed to be organizing it? Where were the people who were supposed to be organizing it? the people who are responsible for it, for setting the policy, for doing the job, and at the end. Where was the money going towards? Where was the money? That's a nice one. Well done. Yeah. Yeah. When? The timeline. What sort of questions and what sort of whens? And how do we relate those whens to the various questions we've been asking there? And maybe the answers as well. When did they get fixed? That's kind of optimistic. When did it get fixed? <laughs> when did the project start and when did it finish? And the stages in between, yeah. the whole Gantt chart. And it reminds me of a lovely Gantt chart I saw that was floating around in the mid-70s when I was a, a junior systems analyst at Rolls-Royce. And it's a lovely Gantt chart, project Gantt chart, all carefully specified at the front end. And there were some nice endpoint type of tasks kind of being sort of 
nicely connected together in a pert network. And in the middle was this sort of fluffy cloud. And then there, there were a couple of cartoon characters looking up at this beautiful, or part of it was beautiful, Gantt chart, or Project Gantt chart, timelines and so on. And the, 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 the stick figure responsible or be pretending or being the project manager was saying, <laughs> oh, and here, waving at the uh, fluffy cloudy bit, here beeth magic. And we all looked at that. I mean, we were involved in lots of projects from, you know, a six-month little one-person piece of software writing to really big projects. And we all looked at that and laughed and fell over laughing. It was so funny because, you know, we could see this reality of difficult, it's kind of complicated. We can't quite plan that bit out, so we'll call it magic. It'll happen somehow or other. And if you get the timelines wrong, it gets really difficult. And there's a wonderful project that one of the government agencies carried out a few years ago, the Ch uh, Child Benefit Agency um, project, where if you put all of that lot together, in terms of the timelines, they had two parallel timelines, a timeline for business process re-engineering and a timeline for specifying, developing, and implementing the IT solution, the software. And that really did bring into really powerful um, visibility this here beeth magic. Because any normal approach to doing a project like that, you would have business process re-engineering first, design it, the whole process, and then, particularly as they were using waterfall type project management, you feed the result of the BPR into the software design, development, and testing. Now, we do things slightly differently today with agile and um, very quick cycles. However, they weren't doing that, and they ended up with both timelines ending in parallel. So they finally knew how the whole business was going to work, all the tasks that everybody was doing, we finally clearly specified and laid out and so on on the day that the software was going to be delivered. And the result was? Failure. Yes. A system which actually took the staff three times longer to enter the data than it did with the old system. kind of interesting. So lots of interesting questions come out of the way as to how you are developing your specification and delivering the software. Because you really, whatever you're doing, even, I mean, it might be true sort of at the macro scale, just if you've only got two time, two big boxes, start, finish, start, finish. But at the micro, you should have finished the definition specify, test, deliver. But you can't do that, can't actually bring it to like that. Not very easily. And then the how question, or perhaps you add an extra one on how much, which brings in the money, the resources, and the quality, and so on. <coughs> but if you think about the hows, or how much is sort of one, the resources, quality, and um, pound notes and so on, the time scale. Have you come across the little triangle, the project triangle, where you've got resources, time scale, and quality, and you have a sort of nice little yellow triangle about like that? And what you're trying to do with a normal project is to optimize those three, because you can never actually get the time scale you want for the money you want and deliver 100% of the functionality. And the West has been pretty good over the last 30, 40, 50 years, in some respects, at kind of optimizing all three. But it does mean you're over, you're over budget, you're late, and you only deliver <coughs> some of what you wanted, or the customer wanted. It's very rare that you get those successful projects. So those are the critical questions. The crucial questions that you need to ask and add lots of words after each one of the W's and the H to get some interesting answers.
<laughs> so what I want you to do <clears throat> is to think of those questions like that and start off the first 15 minutes doing your research, discussing in your small gr smaller groups, um, starting off with LASCAD, to try and pull out of all of that research you did last week, to pull out what actually was happening. How did the time sequence actually happen? What was going on? At what point did they begin to think that maybe there was a disaster brewing? At what point did they really come to really properly believe that they had a problem, rather than just shoving the problems under the carpet. How many of you watch The Simpsons occasionally? Do you remember that amazing incident, uh, episode, where, um, what's her name, Homer's wife, what's she called? Marge. Marge went into prison by accident because she'd accidentally nicked a bottle of whiskey or something. Do you remember that incident? And yeah. so she was in jail for a week, or so, and the family were at home, weren't they? And Homer was looking after the kids. And can you remember what happened to the house? What it looked like? Yeah, bomb site. Like a bomb site. That's right. And just before she came into the door, what did they do to tidy up? Hid it all. Where? Under the carpet. They hid it. They lifted the carpet. Homer lifted the carpet, and the kids were. And the carpet looked sort of like that, a sort of mountain. And one of the problems that you'll see with all three of the projects, an awful lot of stuff got brushed under the carpet. But the problem is, carpets actually kind of amplify the problem and eventually it becomes very, very clear where things went wrong or that things had gone catastrophically wrong. Um, so when in the timeline, what happened when? Who knew what when? And you know, if you look at the press yesterday or in this morning, out in Wolfsburg, the police are crawling through the offices of the engineering areas and other parts of the VW um, engineering base and the company headquarters. They're going out to people's homes of the people they think might have some information. They're going and looking at their PCs and all their storage devices. Going to try and find out all sorts of these aspects. Four major sets of questions you, you need to ask yourselves about LASCAD. And then we'll do that for he, uh, terminal, uh, sorry, Denver City, International Airport, sorry. And then we'll have a look, if we've got time, we'll have a look at um, Heathrow as well. And w when we're looking at Heathrow, what will be interesting, once we've looked at Heathrow, it will be interesting to compare the timelines of the Denver Airport and Heathrow and the two problems with the baggage handling systems to see where the similarities are and where the differences are. Having got the answers to those four questions, you've got lots of data. So first thing is, what's it mean? How do you turn that data into information? Then have a look at some of the literature you need to be looking for to understand service manage, IT services management and project management. Because that, those sources, whether you get it from academic articles or whether you get it from the sort of professional websites like the Project Management Institute uh, website or, or whatever, does what you find out in your analysis of those three projects, does that give you answers to what went wrong and what should have happened that correlate and agree with your literature sources, or do you have different sets of conclusions? Because that's how you build this understanding of how the real world works and how academic research and other professional sources help us to understand the way that the real world actually works rather than maybe we think it ought to work. So, in your groups, let's start off with LASCAD. 
and have about 15 minutes of discussion, draw out some of the most important lessons that you can understand based on those questions that you've just been through. And then we'll have a little discussion to put, draw the threads together, and then we'll do the same with Denver, and then we'll do the same with Heathrow. And then at the end of that, we'll try and see what the common, any common lessons, any common themes, any common approaches, and see whether there are big lessons to be learned rather than the individual lessons from three separate projects. Okay, folks? <clears throat>